We are good to go. All right. Um, all right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, welcome, especially to, um, I mean, Adam, you're, of course, always valued, but as the master of the recording. Oh, there you go. Especially valued. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so I thought we might kick this off um, with, um, the, Tom, I've got some great questions for you in a little bit. I, we had an amazing space last week um, with with Jessamine and, and G. Pascal Zachary. Um I, I mean, Adam, what were some, uh, do you have some favorite moments from that? I, I've got a couple. You know, just this, I, I was I was very curious about how it was going to come together because we're talking about uh, more topics perhaps than we usually do. We had like six or seven where usually we, we have one or two. And just the, the way that the two books intersected about uh, Soul and New Machine being about the product and totally ignoring the families, like Jessamine only being mentioned uh, Thomas' daughter as uh, as the person he went on a bike ride with one day, as opposed to Showstopper really showing the the, the human carnage left in the wake of this product. So I, I love that part of it. I thought that was amazing. I thought the interplay between uh, Jessman and and Zach Greg uh, was was amazing. I also I have to say the D base and the Ashton Tate. Oh my God! Do we need a book on Ashton Tate? Did you go into that Wikipedia page? No, that Wikipedia page will take you out. That Ashton Tate is mesmerizing, um, and D, I, like so, D base four. You should look at the. I mean, obviously, it's like it's it's Wikipedia, so it's obviously like I guess not authoritative. I mean, it's not authoritative for sure. I mean, so I tell my kids, but um, oh my god, in terms of the reasons for failure of D base four. Basically, the thing was a wreck. It didn't work, according to the, according to my sources at Wikipedia. Um, but then they have all these like strange pivots into like personal information software, including Friday. Bang! <laughs> Friday was like a like a didn't we use like Sidekick back in the day on the on a PC. It, this is like Google Calendar for DOS. If that makes any sense, this is, that's awesome. It's it's so weird. It's that's so the anyway. freaky. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I and uh, in particular, uh, we got so uh, Cole collected some tra- and has been collecting terrific notes for the spaces. So Twitter, so Cole, we're really uh, grateful for that. Um, you had some good questions that you were asking online, so I would thought you might be able to kick us off by asking some of those questions. Yeah, totally. And, uh, oh, can you hear me? Yep. Can anyone hear me? We can hear you loud okay, and clear. Sweet. Totally. I really appreciate it, uh, the, the thank you, and so you're welcome. And uh, I was kind of wondering about some of the phrasing they use. So they called it an operating program, not an operating system. That was very odd. Uh, and I was just wondering if that was for kind of the layperson, the reader, you know, to kind of make more sense of it, or if that's actually what they used to call operating systems. So my answer to that would love Tom's answer and others' answer, but my answer to that is that it, it, is, it was an operating system. It was known as an operating system. And I think the, the, the kind of two potential answers are, one, um, Zach is calling it an operating program to kind of connect. He's deliberately trying to connect, as Kidder did, to a non-technical readership. So that it may be a bit of that. I also wonder if it's a bit of – there is a trend – to talk about like operating environments instead of operating systems. And Adam, I I made references before you joined, um, but I ran across this talk that Steve Jobs gave at MIT to Sloan in in 1992. And boy, does it make uh, interesting viewing in contrast or in addition to the Steve Jobs and the next big thing that we talked about a couple weeks ago. Um, he viewed, so in particular in that talk, I mean, there are a lot of things that are interesting in that talk, but one of the things that's interesting in the talk is he is called your question. He is adamant that next step is not an operating system. It is an operating environment. So, wow. so there is a little bit of a zeitgeist at that time. And I remember like we were calling Solaris an operating environment as well. So I think people are trying to get out from underneath the kind of the DOS and OS stigma. Does that, Tom, does that, does that, does that make any sense? Yeah, I, I think for a while, people thought, started thinking of operating systems as totally boring and commoditized. And so it was, it was, it was all marketing. 
but also <laughs> em emphasizing with next step, you know, the windowing system. Well, and the, yeah. Well, so like from my perspective, you know, just, you know, I went back and watched some of those things, you know, just because for the lulls, really. Something that I that I thought was quite interesting was when you're, they talk about operating environments versus operating systems, they talk about the context of what the user can actually do within it, which is something that, you know, when you talk about the DOS-based stuff and things like that, or even like really old Windows, right? They, it's not really talking about what you can do in the environment. It's talking about what it lets you do outside of it, like running your programs and whatnot. It, a big part of it was, at least to me, it seemed like we are talking about what this in, what the operating system gives you. And if you talk about it as an environment, then it gives you that imagery that this is something that you're in and you can do stuff in and participate in, which is something that is different from, say, a cold meaning of the word system. Yeah, interesting. And, and that definitely dovetails exactly with what Jobs was saying about Next Step, for whatever it's worth, and talking about the ability to create applications faster um, and how they were, how Sun was coming after them and they were annihilating Sun at this. It was, it was uh, interesting talk, honestly. Um, always interesting to hear Jobs when he's like healthy and, uh, I mean, you forget how kind of robust he was before when he was not sick. Uh, so, so Cole, well, he also. Sorry, go ahead, Neil. So, yeah, so he also, he, you know, those things that he said during his talking about Next versus Sun, he actually replayed a lot of the same verbiage when he was talking about Mac OS X. When he launched, when it launched it with Aqua and all that stuff, there was a lot of focus on what Mac OS X itself did for you. And that's like the things with the widgets, with the UI, the, um, the finder enhancement, spotlight, um, all those things. Like, those are features that are part of the operating environment itself, the desktop environment, or if you want to call it by classical terms. But they considered it one and the same. And that kind of mindset, um, I think, is what drove them to develop a usable, uh, seamless, interactive experience for users. Yeah, interesting. Which I think everyone else didn't do. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, and, I mean, certainly it was, it was definitely an inflection point. Uh, and then, Cole, you had another, uh, another good question, I thought. Yeah, so um, uh, Pascal, uh, the author of the book, had talked about wanting to support NT, wanting to support different kind of modes of operation, wanting to support Windows programs, but also OS2 programs, and they called them personalities. And so they called it supporting multiple personalities. Yeah. And I just thought that was the, the most odd phrasing I had ever heard of that. And, and Brian, but, I don't know about I don't know for you, but that that comment really just transported me back <laughs> to like the late nineties. Absolutely. Because, oh my uh, goodness, I remember all that. You know, <laughs> it, 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 no, no, totally. Where where I you know I, I had this moment reading through the Showstopper, thinking, oh yeah, didn't NT run on on like alpha systems? Like, am I? Am I just imagining no, it that? Did. It was just a beautiful I, dream. Yeah, obviously, and they got to it in the book, but but I I, I definitely forgotten about that for about twenty years. Absolutely, and I remember <laughs> running NT on a PowerPC Mac, like it was a thing. That's awesome. It was hard, but it was it was possible. Yeah, so I no, I Adam, I felt the exact same way. It was I felt like I could hear like Smashing Pumpkins playing on the radio. I think, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was like you know, Rage Against the Machine. I felt like right. I was it was. Getting me right back in that '90s zeitgeist. So, Cole, as you may be inferring, personality is very much a technical term from the '90s, and there is this kind of idea that um, we are going to make a um, an operating system, operating environment um, that looks like another one. And uh, Tom, you had left Sun before Spring, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, I I heard a lot about it. But uh, oh. So Spring was kind of like the ne plus ultra of this, of we are going to support arbitrary personalities. We're going to have a microkernel-based system. Um, mock, I think, I mean, I don't know, but I think the personality term must have originated with Mock, I would imagine. It did. It, it came from CMU Mock, which both uh, GNU Herd and Mac OS X XNU inherited. Yeah. So the... It, and for me, it's very like a, a, evocative of the 90s because we actually, as an undergraduate, 
developed a uh, in our operating systems course I had a professor god bless him loved to stay current and he loved to kind of redo the project to stay current and unfortunately current in 1993 meant developing a microkernel based operating system with a personality um so it, <clears throat> it, it, we developed a spring like operating system um which was just absolutely brutal but uh that those times are back right so now we have um you know we have the m1 and we have arm and uh and you know we have windows subsystem for linux and you know it's kind of like personalities and different architectures and you know the days of running windows nt on your alpha it's kind of coming back right it, it is kind of coming back yeah but it's differently it's it's different though this time uh, i would also impl like another aspect of this is that back then in the 90s it was all about pulling other types of things into one in this case it's putting one thing into other stuff and so like the terminology of using subsystem and things like that kind of implies that it's not about bringing them together in a way where it's like a unified thing, even though in some cases like LXSS or WSL as it's branded actually does some of this. It, it's not about the same kind of unification that you saw with Windows NT4 with the POSIX OS2 and Win32 uh, personalities. It, it's a little different in that way. Yeah, these these days you have virtualization everywhere, which uh, yeah lets you lets you do all these personalities. But in the original personality concept, you know, it went along with microkernels. They were assumed that separate personalities made something simpler. Whereas that, <laughs> today that's not true. Yeah, well, I, that was not true. I don't know if that was true even then. Although yeah. a lot of people believed it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, I, I, there there is sort of an ideal uh, quaint idealism to it. And sort of a bleakness to this Dockerized world, where people often take the view that you could never configure your system properly. So I'm just going to ship everything, and just take static link linking to the absolute extreme in order for you to run this thing. Please stop making me sad. <laughs> yeah. It, so, uh, the, Cole, that's a long answer to your to your question um, about the, uh, the but the so personality is very very much a term. And uh, Simeon, I think it's kind of it's an interesting point that um, you know a lot of this stuff has actually come back and has been uh, has become newly relevant or or more practical. There's a there's another thing which I'm kind of curious about, and that's like the the microkernel stuff. So. Microkernels, mm, I guess you got mock um, and you got various like embedded stuff. Um, you know, that microkernels seem to be very popular in, you know, uh, embedded operating systems, especially safety critical stuff. But, you know, there's, of course, the famous Torvalds um, uh, disagreeing with Tannenbaum about Minix um, debate. And, and now I hear, you know, you folks are working on a microkernel OS for, <laughs> what is it, Hubris? It is. So, you know, tell us about that. Yeah, I was going to actually, I, I, I was trying to get Laura in here as well as a, as a, a speaker. But uh, yeah, we, uh, well, and so I, in terms of my, my own history with microkernels, um, because I was coming up in this time of personalities, Cole, and when this were very much in vogue, and we had developed this, this microkernel based um, system as an undergraduate project. So I actually went to work for a microkernel OS company um, called QNX, QNX. Um, and it was great. I mean, a microkernel system, it, it's basically, it's a message passing system, L3, L4 like system QNX was. And my view on QNX was like, why would we not run this absolutely everywhere? And we should open source it and it should be everywhere. And I still feel like it could be in an alternate reality. Um, Qnix, you, you got a you got a disk. I remember you got a disk that you could actually boot Qnix on a on an x86 machine. The, you, you've got a good memory. So that was a 1.44 megabyte floppy disk. That was from Dan Hildebrand, who sadly died um, of died of brain cancer. Maybe six or seven years after that. I loved Dan. Dan had such an impact on my own career. Um, he actually is the reason I was at Qnix. Um, and Dan was so enthusiastic and was always looking for like new ways to kind of talk about what we could go do with Qnix. So he had this idea of like, we should put it on a 1.44 megabyte floppy. Um, and yeah, that's it. Did you run it, Simeon? Did you, did you play with that? Yeah, I mean, I guess it is like, um, I don't know if you guys ever saw Oberon. Um, that was also like a weird operating system that you could boot on a single floppy. Um, 
Yeah, you know, booted it up. Um, it was kind of cute. It had a sort of a, a nice little GUI that's sort of reminiscent of, um, you know, other of the small GUI operating systems. Um, and it, it was Unix-like, if I remember correctly, but I never did much with it. If you do, and you, you, yeah, you've got a very good memory. Um, that GUI was called um, Photon. Um, and the um, and Photon was super interesting. I thought um, it, it was kind of this, and very much leveraged the message passing architecture of the system. So this is a long way of uh, of kind of this is kind of some of the backdrop for me personally. Um, Laura, do you want to kind of take it from here and talk about what we're doing with with Hubris? Sure, I can talk a little bit about what we were doing with Hubris. Um, I, I think probably I, I should probably back up and say is when I first joined Oxide, I started out by writing in uh, RFD. It's because at Oxide we do a lot of writing. And I started one talking about trying to do a survey about, okay, what exactly is, was over there, what we were going to do for a microcontroller operating system. And I think I had done a pretty wide survey. And, and somewhere in there I had a thing about, you know, writer and operating system. And I think I should put, put in there, no, this is a bad idea. We probably wouldn't do this, yada, yada. There was plenty of other things out there, and lo and behold, we ended up writing our own. And I and I think I, I say this just because I think what we found is, is that we really wanted this thing to be fairly precise, to be able to have the isolation, I think, more than anything for what we wanted, and be able to have something that's correct. And of course, also in Rust, so what we were trying to go back for. So I, I think we really, hopefully, be able to try and learn from the core of the of the. Uh, various microkernels to be able to deliver something that is hopefully small and also very useful and also very particular and I think opinionated about what exactly it does. Um, I think especially learning from I think uh, other things out there, uh, probably we chose very particular paths such as being able to deliver the core kernel and apps together so there is a single image and things like that I think more than anything and um, I, I mean it's also I think everybody also dreams about getting to write their own operating system from scratch. So the chance to be able to do that, I think, has been fantastic. And it's, it's been a great learning experience, I think, just to be able to see things out. Um, uh, Cliff, who is one of our colleagues, who is uh, smarter than all of us and not on Twitter, has done a lot of the design work to be able to get this off the ground. And has been a very precise and you know good about trying to make sure that this thing is very correctness focused among everything else. And also to make, uh, make sure that it is hard to misuse a lot of these interfaces as well, especially when we're trying to do things I, um, in terms of just being able to say, write a driver and then be able to have an interface that's hard to screw things up. So, and so, and Laura, had you worked on a microkernel based system before? I assume, I mean, I had worked on one for 25 years, so I assume you, you had not or? No, I, I, when I, in college, I had read papers about it and other things like that, but I think this is also one of these things that I don't think I had fully internalized uh, what exactly it meant to work on say, a micro micro kernel or anything uh, like that? And and how have you found it in terms of like develop? Because you and I have obviously both developed drivers for Hubris and tasks and so on. How have you found it? Uh, I've enjoyed it so far. I, I think it's certainly. I think also because it is ultimately an embedded sy system and a fairly flat one. I, I think it's it's not certain things are, are missing, but. Um, I think it's also forced you to think about exactly how are you sharing the memory and various models, I think, of concurrency as well. I, I think that that's the other thing. Um, yeah. And it's probably also worth explaining, I think, one of, one of Cliff's great insights, and it kind of this came about as we were thinking about our own root of trust and how you deal with, with what a program looks like in an embedded system and how you kind of sign that and how you attest to that. And one of the mistakes, honestly, that general purpose embedded systems make is the ability to load an arbitrary program. But an embedded system, you don't need to load an arbitrary program. You know when you build that particular image, you know all the programs that are going to be in there. And I think one of Cliff's great observations was, hey, if we know all that, we can actually know statically what our tasks are. And then you're not doing any dynamic allocation. So when a task dies, you know that the memory that that task was using is available for that task to be restarted because that task is now dead. So now it's alive again. And there's like a, a bunch of, so there's very little dynamic allocation. I mean, I, Laura, so far, I think we've got damn near zero dynamic memory allocation. Yeah, I, I think more than anything, I think especially for what we've been doing right now, it's a lot of been figuring out, I think, the basis about what actually works for a driver. And I think also in particular, um, 
one thing we've also made the interesting choice is to not is a uh, lack of preemption, which has also solved a lot of. I'm not going to say solved a lot of problems, but it is presented to us with a focused set of problems to be able to solve. But yeah, the, the lack of dynamic allocation, or at least the so far we haven't found the need to have it, I, I think is made, made things easier. And I think that's that's been also with part of our design is that before we add something, we spend a long time trying to say, okay, but do we really need this? Because I think in particular because it's a you know, microkernel IPC based uh, system, we've been, it's been synchronous. And I think we spent a long time trying to say, okay, but do we really need asynchronous? And, you know, spending a long time before we really need to add anything like that, I conclusion so far as that, no, we haven't actually found the need to add anything like that yet, which I think has been forcing ourselves to make sure we're using the right tool for the job and not just adding things because we get really excited about them or uh, anything like that. Yeah, and I love, you know, Laura made allusion to this RFD that she wrote about, like, and it, I, Laura, I think it was, like, almost verbatim for the RFD. It's like, well, it would be great. Everyone would dream about writing operas from scratch. But, of course, that doesn't make sense for us. And then as we investigate it more, it's like, actually, this does make sense for us. <laughs> so this is... Uh, well, presumably you guys so, uh, had a look at talk. I mean, I've seen some of your stuff um, online about talk and, and found some issues with it that it wouldn't work. Yeah, so I would say that talk is, um, I mean, so talk is real. First of all, love talk, love, I mean, love Philip, love what they've done there. They, 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 I think that it's got great admiration for talk. I think part of the challenge for talk is it was really designed to be a, a teaching operating system, which is great and admirable. But so dynamic program loading is something that's very important to talk, the ability to load a, a new binary. And in, in some ways, I don't know about you, for you, Laura, but for me, like, that was part of the, of the, uh, of, of the kind of, um, it was a very catalytic in terms of thinking, wait a minute, how would the talk loader look in an environment where everything needs to be signed? And we're like, oh my God, this is just going to get super, super gnarly. And I don't know, I've, I've been, in my memory, it was kind of about that time that Cliff was beginning to think, like, maybe we need to do a, go a totally different route. So... You know, something about all this that, you know, as you you and Laura have been talking about this, you know, I, I've been thinking about there's lots and lots and lots of operating systems for embedded and, and various RTOS and smallware stuff. And what Laura said about, do we really need dynamic allocation? Do we need arbitrary codex, uh, co program loading? And the answer to those were no. And I think this is where it becomes easier to make an operating system if you want to because you're not implementing a full operating system you're implementing a special purpose one right. effectively and that lets you make all call all kinds of trade-offs that make it tons easier to implement a system of well that's choice. right and i think that you know another very important thing that we did is that we have got an all rust user land um which talk actually talks has struggled a bit with the rust user land. i mean laura i saw you unmuting there to talk about some of the kind of our thinking there about why not talk yeah, I, I mean, I, I also agree with Brian is that the talk people were great to work with, and I, I definitely appreciate all the support they gave us. And I, I think ultimately it kind of came down to we had different ideas about um, what they do, want to do. And, and I, I hope, really hope to see talk continue to grow and succeed just because I think, you know, ha having more operating systems out there is a, a great choice. And I, I think also to Brian's point about like user programs, I think that that wasn't back one of the pain points. And I think also the all our choice to do everything in Rust, I think, has also certainly made things easier. Just because I think that was trying to do um, potentially support C programs or having to think about that for talk made just a, another set of things to for us to have, be able to try and worry about that we don't have to do so with, with our own thing. Right, and actually, Lauren Adam, I just had a bad ropey rippy flashback as well. I, 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 <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I mean, Laura, this discussion was taking me back to it was just about just about a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago. That I mean, you mostly, but me, some were struggling with just uh, how we were going to handle the the slots and talk. And it was just, it's not that it was misdesigned. It was just a different design center. Yeah. yeah and, and your example about Ropey Ropey, I think this is also um, discussing some of the growing kids, I think, of Risk 5 as well, because that was the other thing is, is that, um, the, so the Ropey Ropey referred to particular compiler features, especially on NoMe systems, um, to be able to uh, do some of the program loading we wanted. I, I think if we have show notes later, I'll, I'll have to go about and indicate some uh, notes on this. But that's an example of something that was major compiler support that was missing, and then trying to figure out how to work around that was a big pain point in terms of trying adding that. And then, I mean, 
you know, oxide jokes about having startups within startups within startups. And I mean, becoming compiler engineers was certainly something, we, you know, again, in terms of, wow, what if we got to be compiler engineers? Sounds like a lot of fun, but it's not actually, you know, our, our core product. Right. And when you're kind of like five startups deep, that's when it's time to be like, wait a minute, where are we exactly? What exactly are we doing? And uh, and I mean, I came away with that with, honestly, there's a lot that I love about RISC-V. So that was the other kind of things, I mean, that we were, because we were looking at open talk on Open Titan. To a certain degree, it ended up also being Risk Five versus Cortex. But then, I, even that, it, I think it, the, the the much larger issue for us was just our use case was just a little bit different. And I, Laura was extremely good very early on, as we are, because it's really hard to start out on a hard, daunting problem when you got so much to do in front of you. And Laura, I just thought you did a great job in those early days of being like, okay, but how do we sign what we need? You know, you're really kind of like already beginning to think about like, this needs to be a root of trust and we're going to need mechanics to kind of manage and sign this. And you begin to think like, yeah, right. This is going to be complicated. Yeah. And then I want to give credit Cliff for uh, being able to point out all of the perils about trying to do things because he had done some, some similar work in the past. So I think, I think one of the things we set out to write hubris is that we spent a lot of time trying to read and learn from what's out there so that ho hopefully is, is that we are making an entirely new set of mistakes as opposed That's to right. um, uh, ones that the people are. That is the second time today I've heard that <laughs> Well, it's, you know, it's that you've been in a second good conversation today. I think trying to make different sets of mistakes is shows a level of self-awareness, but we are definitely trying to make different mistakes. You know, Laura, I can't remember if I talked to you about one of the very surprising differences between Cunix and a monolithic system. But this one was very uh, – it, 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 one of the, the perils of microkernel robustness, and I really only appreciated this when I got to Sun. At Cunix, both the file system and the networking stack were pretty buggy. We're, like, very buggy. And part of the reason that there was like not a huge, I mean, it's like people wanted to fix bugs, but when you can just like restart the network stack when it dies or restart the file system, like the machine doesn't bounce, there's a little bit less of a social pressure to kind of fix some of these issues. And I remember it's like having this thought at Sun being like, wow, if the file system has an error, the entire operating system crashes. And boy, we are really focused on making a robust file system, making a robust networking stack. Um, so I think we want to not repeat. We want to not, I think we want to never use Hubris's robustness as an excuse for making slipshod tasks, I would say. Not that we would. The other thing, That's going to be really hard well, to yeah, avoid, though, so because... I mean, because so, well, well, because like if you it thinks of, like when you're doing that, you have to think about like how important is a failure domain, and and when you're talking about microkernels that are robust and that will just basically whack things until they work, uh, and you don't notice, right? The most important part is that you don't notice because otherwise they're not robust. Then then how important is sure. it? Anymore? And like and you definitely get that they're you know how much do you want a single task to kind of uh, continue to soldier on when it's in, when it is kind of arbitrary corrupted. I think one of the things that, Laura, I don't know about you, but I have definitely appreciated, I mean, I feel that like I have always been pro memory protection. <laughs> I don't feel I've ever been, uh, I mean. Why would you be anti-memory well, well, protection? Well, so, so, last week. I mean, when you, learned of, when you learned of it finally, having your, uh, your childhood <laughs> stolen by Bill Gates, but yeah, see last week for, for more on that. Right, Viz last week. And, oh no! And, well, and I mean, it just Microsoft being very explicitly anti-memory protection, and Cutler and Gates having this huge argument inside that that uh, that is outlined in Showstopper is really compelling. But one of the things that I feel that I that I mean, I have always been very pro-memory protection, but this whole experience has made me way more pro-memory protection. I mean, Laura, I don't know what your take is on it, but boy, the MPU has been essential for us. Yeah, and, and I think it's also important to to point out that this is an MMU system, but it does have the MPU pr protection just to be able to protect from physical memory access, which I agree has been absolutely essential. But in, in some respects, it may be one of the things that you could potentially make a trip says, okay, the system is potentially so simple, do we really need the ex perhaps expense about trying to set these things up or other things like that, which I, I can see in the abstract why someone might make that trade up, but no, I, I would not want to be doing this uh, without any kind of memory protection just from you know screwing things up yeah, and i think that one of the things that i've appreciated again laura i don't know about you but i have kind of appreciated that um the 
unsafe operations in Rust, in otherwise safe Rust, are all the stack operations. And, you know, there was a, in earlier days of Hubris, we, you know, you've got a task has got a single region and, uh, and stacks are, would effectively grow if stacks overflowed they would not hit the protection boundary. They would hit the data segment of the process. And that created some rust bu bugs in like, C in like otherwise correct safe rust, but a stack overflow now becomes this really pernicious memory corruption. So Laura, I mean, I know I, I dealt with a couple of those. I think you dealt with a couple of those too, right? Where you'd have something that like is trying to panic because it's trying to go deeper into the stack and instead it's inducing data corruption. Yeah, I, so so I, I'd say that stack corruption has always been one of these things that's very trickle, difficult to try and debug in the first place just because you can end up with stuff that just looks like complete nonsense because you can't actually usually get a backtrace. But yes, I, I think that adding additional protection to be able to, to find that has been really key. And I think even just with trying to do basic debugging, I think particularly the way we have things structured, um, you're only getting access to a particular regions of, I think, even sets of registers, which is also another way, I think, to really be able to fully audit, okay, and ask, does this driver really need access to this particular memory block, or can it provide even more isolation, I think, is, which is uh, another way, I think, of just making sure things are even more protected, and I think really makes you think about things a little bit more as well. Yeah, Laura's raising a good point. So another thing that we've done in, in Hubris is there's this kind of, for any given image, there's this kind of uh, Tomble file that describes, here are the tasks I'm going to have, here is kind of the, 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 the how they're going to be sized, and then here are the specific device drivers, that it, device memory regions that it needs access to, which allows us to really kind of construct things. And to close, to get the punchline, how, how did you guys close up that um, that ability to corrupt uh, the data segment from a stack overflow? Um, we we flipped them. So we had the stack. So the, uh, it used to be that the stack is at the top of the memory protection region, and the data is at the bottom. And then the if your stack overflowed, it would overflow into your data. And it's also stack overflow is the worst because it's corrupt and run where I, you know, I go deep on one stack trace and I maybe hit just like one byte um, in your data segment and then I run away. I run my stack on wines and like I haven't died, but you are now corrupt. Got it. a hit and run, yeah. A total hit and run. And so the um, we flipped those and had the stack then um, grows towards the protection boundary. So the data's at the top, the stack's at the bottom and you can still you know, construct certainly on safe rust that would corrupt itself. But um, now when you stack, when your stack overflows, you hit the protection boundary and you die cleanly. Nice. And sorry, Laura, are we trying to get in there? I didn't mean to cut you off there. Oh, no, that, I, I think you covered everything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been, uh, it's been, I mean, it's been fun, bluntly. It's been, it's been great. I feel like we, the, the uh, and I mean, all credit due Cliff, um, who is the, and it definitely it's, you get Cliff's sense of humor in, in hubris, which I got to say, I, I, Laura, I don't know about you. I still laugh every time at the, so uh, the hubris, uh, of course, we make reference to the Ozymandias um, the, from the, the, the famous poem, it was a Shelley poem, right? Um, the, uh, I, so we are bought that if you have any Rust format, that's incorrect. Adam, do you know this? Have, have you seen this? No, I haven't seen it. Oh my God, this is so good. I almost want to make you discover this naturally, but I, 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 I can't at this point. So if you have uh, any Rust, if you've got a Rust format issue, the bot will correct your formatting. Um, it, the bot's name is Ozymandias um, in Greek. Um, and the, <laughs> the comment, which I can't even relate to you without laughing, uh, it's not my joke, so I feel like I can laugh at it, is all in caps, look upon my reformatting, ye mighty and despair, bang, which I just think is great. Nice. I don't know, Laura, maybe I've got a, I, I'm not sure if that, if that gets a chuckle out of you, but that gets a chuckle. I, not to the point where I've deliberately introduced formatting problems, though, I'd like to say. I don't know. I don't believe you, No, Brian. I actually, no, no, I've got a complicated enough relationship with Rust format as it is. I, I, I need to... I, are, are we going to have to put a dollar in the Brian complains about Rust format jar? I, I've already put one in. Does that mean that I get to complain about Rust format if I put one in in advance? <laughs> yes. Yes. You, you know what? I we've got. I, there's no open issue on our our what issue? No, it's fine. Actually, I, I I'm 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 becoming fine with Rust format. I'm gonna still put my dollar in the jar anyway, but I have I'm at peace with the Rust format in part because I tell it to skip things that I feel it's not formatting well. But you know, I'm trying to be better.
So you've bludgeoned it into well, acceptance. It's just, it's, so the, the, in particular, the, what, the way Rust format works is it rewrites code, which I really, I really admire, oh, yeah. actually, that it, is, that it is not like a style checker. It is a code rewriter. And the fact that it gets it like so correct so frequently is actually very impressive. You know, Brian, that, that is a, a big shift because I think a year ago, you would not have admired it. You described it, I think, as a war crime. So it's a quite quite an evolution. I, I remember. Uh, you know, you, I am. I remember Brian describing it okay, as a I war am crime. Trying to be on on my my best behavior. First of all, I reserve that language apparently for Stalebot, which Laura also. <laughs> <laughs> just maybe we can. Laura's got a great blog entry to write on the on the. the I was I was deriding the Stalebot because I was in a project in which it is not used very well, and Laura was rightfully pointing out like, hey, Stalebot can be really important in a project where you have got a lot of uh, consumer facing open source. Laura, is that a fair description? I think that's reasonable. Uh, but and to be fair, I, I think your gripe about Stalebot in this particular instance was valid. Yeah, I mean, I think actually that Laura and I both actually have the same issue when it, the same root issue, which is, you know, in an issues database, you've got two people meeting. You've got the submitter, at least two people meeting, many people meeting. You've got the submitter and you've got the issue that they have and maybe the people that they represent. And then you have the people that are maintaining the project, right? Um, I guess this is like, we, we should do like a law and order intro for there are two sides to get up, to get up <laughs> issues. Um, the the people who submit issues and the people who close them out is not reproducible. Bum bum. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh lord. But I think that that Laura's issue, which is a is a totally legit issue, is when people file issues without real empathy for the maintainers, and especially when you've got a big project that is consumer facing or has a very broad market facing. People really do not treat. I mean, in these poor, you know, it's like it's the XKCD, right? With everything depending on an open source project that's been neglected for years. I feel that like people don't treat those maintainers very well, and they they treat them in a very entitled way. Um, and I think Laura's objection, Laura, I, I obviously correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I think Laura's objection is when people are kind of filing issues without empathy for the person that's going to read that issue. Is that fair? I think that's fair. And I think it's also a matter of, I think your point about, you know, for the submitter is also a good one. Because the point is, is that okay? It, it is, I think open source is only supposed to be a collaborative process. So the point is, is that how are you exactly working together to try and solve this? And I think the point is, is that when a submitter is making a bug, you, especially as maintainer, I spent a long time trying to figure out, okay, how exactly is that going to work with this? And I mean, sometimes unfortunately the submitters just don't give you a lot to work with. It ends up being stuck between a rock and a hard place. It says, okay, I can try and close this bug now and tell them, sorry, I don't think I'm ever actually going to get to, the, to this, or I can let it go for a while, and maybe it'll get fixed by something else for something else, just happen, through happenstance. And you're sort of left between there. On the other hand, this is also a case of where I think of your example, where um, if, you, if you're a submitter and you spend a lot of time trying to really find a bug, and perhaps you've given like the backtracks, you've done a lot of debugging already, you just need a maintainer to do a lot more of their specialized expertise and do that, and see that gets close, that really hurts as well for both of those cases. So it really is, you have both sides of the same, the same coin for empathy about it, figuring out exactly how to do this. And I, I do think, I still think that there are some cases where automatically closing bugs can be useful. But again, as you know, I, I think I pointed out is that bots should be supplementing maintainers, not fully replacing them. And I think this does mean that the maintainer needs to evolve to be trying to use their best judgment about really trying to work with submitters to actually solve the problem. That, that, that's right. Stalebot, as a defense for hardworking, earnest sub, um, maintainers who are trying to do the right thing, that's one thing. But as a, um, like a defense from, from uh, users who are trying to uh, misuse their time. But I think in this case, at least, this was a, a proxy. Like, instead of being uh, a diligent maintainer, this was kind of closing things out. And Brian, you said, you know, uh, the maintainers and the folks submitting the issues are supposed to meet in the issues. But when you see, you know, reports of data corruption that have gone uncommented on despite thorough review, that's really disheartening. It is, and I have to tell, I feel like that, you know, may all of the open source projects you use be blessed with an issue that you encounter early, because I do feel like the, the when you discover an issue with a project and you as a submitter, like, okay, we're using this project, I want to make sure that I am treating others the way I want to be treated, and I do a lot of homework and then and submit that, 
how is that issue received? And when that issue is received well, it feels great on all sides, actually. It's like, I, I mean, I've had a couple projects where, and then there's some projects where you're like, you know, this project, there are things I don't like about this project, but they're really receptive to my feedback. And I actually really appreciate that. And Brian, can I talk about a fun bug? Uh, so I worked on Qnix for about uh, five years. About 10 years ago, I started working on uh, Qnix on an um, embedded Internet of Things uh, operating system. And, and so on 32-bit, um, it's unsigned. So we've got this 2038 problem coming up, and it's kind of like Y2K. And I knew about it, and but it, I set it for 2106 since it's uh, unsigned. And uh, it crashed the system, so that that uh, you know represented something they needed to fix. Uh, you know, normally if it rolls over, it's no big deal. But uh, you know, so I had to argue for that bug uh, to get fixed. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so what years? And and then um, Black Black Blackberry owns the uh, Qnix now. Uh, that I'll I'll take uh, take it offline here. Yeah. So it, it, and it's I mean, Qnix had kind of a funky history. They they were uh, independent for a long time. Um, and the owners and the the, the kind of co-inventors of Cunix, Dan Dodge and Garbell, were are terrific folks. Um, but they then it went to BlackBerry. Uh, it went to Harmon. Um, I think it went to Harmon. I think after BlackBerry, before BlackBerry, it was. I think it was before BlackBerry, right? So it's before BlackBerry because it's at BlackBerry right. now. And uh, so the the um, and I'd be curious to know kind of when your un, unsigned issue was. I think the other thing that that that, that happened to Qnix that's kind of interesting is that, that harkens back to the discussion last time. They wrote all of the POSIX utilities. They decided that they didn't like the price. There were folks that were selling POSIX utilities, and this is like before, like right before the GNU utilities are really viable. So this is like 1990, 1990 maybe, 1989, 1990, 1991. And Tom, I mean, I know this is like bullseye for you, so maybe you can you can expand on this. But they ended up with not wanting to go from like what Mentat or I can't, there were some folks that had POSIX utilities that they could buy. But Dan, if I recall correctly, Dan puked at the price and decided, screw it, we're going to rewrite it. And they <laughs> wrote everything. So they wrote their own AUK at Cunix. Which I think oh. is right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I. That horrifies I never, me. I never knew much about QNX, but I've never heard any, anyone say anything bad about it. So QNX was it was very endearing in a lot of ways, um, and they like I said they had their own de novo implementation of awk and said and what were some of these? So as a result, like some of the engineers there, like Steve McPowan, I know would and um, uh, Peter Vanderveen, they would have, I mean, in terms of like trivia masters on the on the, the Unix utilities because they'd implement them all from scratch. How about NROF, TROF? No, absolutely. I think that they did the whole, it, it, they did everything required for POSIX. So they wanted what was then POSIX.4 real-time compliance. Um, and so that's what they had to go implement. Um, and um, Popoka... That means they wrote their own vibe. Okay. I, funny you should say that. I was just going to say that the Vi, VI divide was, first of all, I was like, I was an undergraduate when I was interning there. I kind of used Emacs, I guess. And I got there and I'm like, like, where's Emacs? And then it was like, just use Vi. I'm like, I don't even know what that is, but I'm going to, okay. So I realized like days later, as I was trying to compile Emacs, I'm like, I think they meant VI when they said Vi. <laughs> Um, I, is that a Canadian thing? I, I don't know if that's a... I did come away with so many Canadianisms. I, you know, I would say processing resources. Um, and I was a big fan of the CFL. I, I actually loved Canada. Um, but the... I'm not sure Vi, is a, if Vi versus VI is a Canadian thing or not. But anyway. I mean, I've always said Vi, even, you know, in uh, as a kid. And I'm an American. I, I've never, I've never like, spent any significant time in Canada other than to go well, to Niagara Falls. I've never heard anything other than Vi. You guys are all wrong. It's Vi. <laughs> right. the only heretic called Vi. Yeah, it's definitely Vi. You know, from Berkeley. Oh, yeah. I know it is Vi, but I've never heard anyone actually say it. Until like right here's, now. Here's an actual Unix trivia question. As in right now. As in right now. This is the first time I've ever heard anyone call it Vi. Lies. Maybe it's, maybe it's that. a generational thing. Wow. Right, here, here, here's the true Unix trivia question. How do you pronounce the name of the standard text editor? ED. Yes. ED yeah. That is correct. It is ED. It, it, Tom, what do you say? Yeah, you I say knew ED. that one. Well, you're, I mean, 
I think I say Ed. I say Ed in VI. I say Ed. I say Ed and Vi as well. So you, say, by the way, but I know that the actual standard way to say it is both Ed and Vi. Okay, I've always I, known that, but I've never said it that way because I've never heard anyone else know, say. I'm it. having your Vi moment. I'm having that with Ed, which I think I've always called Ed. Adam, what have you called Ed? You know, I'm I call it Ed, but I think I might have learned that from you. No, I think you definitely so. learned it from me. I, I'm so sorry. I've obviously like <laughs> I, 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 I. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't come up that much. Off with their Eds. Thank God. I, I just like how Brian tried to totally downplay being an Emacs user and was like... I mean, I oh, no, Emacs represent. I was going to say that. Emacs for the win. I, I, I view Emacs as a, as a youthful indiscretion, Dan. I, 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 you know, I actually, honestly, it was very helpful to learn. Uh, uh, hand on heart, the reason I became a VI user effectively after that summer is because I could know that any system I would be on would have it and I wouldn't have to compile it. And that's also the reason that I ended up learning what I used to call ED up until several minutes ago. Um, but I now know that it'd be called ED. Do we, do we call it SED for the stream editor out of curiosity, Dan? No. That's, yes. No, that's, yeah. that's, oh, yes. No, oh, my God. Call it that. That's good. <laughs> oh, my God. Is, no. No. <laughs> No, sorry, Neil, Neil, you do not call it SED. You call it SED and AWK. I call it said and awk. Right, right. right. You are correct. <laughs> you are correct. However, I did. Wait, wait. However, oh great Unix decider, who is correct among us? The 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 ED editor is uh, the um, follow on from QED. It is yes. So this, that helps. Okay. If that helps anyone remember how to how to pronounce. I, okay. <laughs> what? Okay, I get it. I get it. I've heard you. Okay. Is this an intervention, Adam? Did you stage this? Are you are you in, in better? Yeah, I've got a banner behind me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's right. Adam learned weeks ago that I had abused him as a young engineer <laughs> and had, had oh, called him the wrong. Teach way. me to call it Ed. <laughs> yeah. Like I will show this like guy. a twenty-five year joke in the making. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. He's like, do you know? Yeah. Do you know why you're a showstopper? Really long. Because Dan told you to be a showstopper. Do you know why Dan told you? Because I told him. It's like you were the puppet master. Oh, that's right. All for this Mr. moment. Kobayashi, right? There you go. Please tell me you guys at least call PS PS because otherwise I don't know what to I do. do yeah, fair enough. No, we do call. It, I, I do call PS. I, I guess I don't have really a real rubric for what I say as words and what I don't. I mean, clearly, I mean. In the like, our communities always find a way to divide themselves. Department, I guess this is like a cube cuddle versus cube CTL issue for Kubernetes. I've always been. A... So I originally called it cube CTL until I heard Kelsey call it cube cuddle, and so I was like, "All right, if that guy calls it cube cuddle, I'll call it that too." Now everybody at work is mad at me for calling right, it and cube then, cuddle. Okay, and then what is the Dan? What is the directory that contains the password file in Unix? Oh, great decider of Unix. How do you pronounce that? The directory that contains the password file. Oops, Tom. sorry. I was at Etsy. Etsy. Okay, that is Etsy, though. But but. Yeah, I've but called that, it Etsy. Is it Etsy? Day, though, it was et, et cetera. It was ex. Well, it was always yeah, etc. Was really pronounced et cetera. It was pronounced et cetera password. Yeah. Yeah, why wouldn't it be? Because it was the et cetera files. It was the stuff that didn't fit anywhere else. But I just amazed that that was actually like the way you would that one the way one would say it. I mean, I've always well, it's why we still we still call USR user like no, for the same not reason. For the same reason. That's where user home directories were initially. Well, I know that, but I'm saying that the fact that it's written as USR, we still call it user. Because we know that what it was supposed to be oh, for. I, I, I see Etsy. Gotcha. Yeah. I, yeah. Look, obviously, uh, yeah, it's where the home directories used to be. I mean, clearly, there's going to be no consistent rubric that's going to get us to this. Actually, I, uh, and even QNX versus QNX, I, I feel that I've heard, I mean, I said QNX, but I felt like I heard, I only called it QNX after having worked there. I called it QNX before going there. Um, and I, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Papaka Tepetal. Te, te how, how do I pronounce your name? Um, Just call me Poka. Okay, there you go. Poka. Poka's easier. Uh, so, Poka, how did you pronounce it uh, when you were using the operating system? Uh, Qnix. Okay, you call it Qnix. Yeah, yeah. So, and Qnix, the origin of that is is quick Unix, by the way. So, Qnix always felt like it made it made sense. Hey, Brian, Brian, pronunciation quiz for you. I heard it called Queenix. Brian, pronunciation quiz for you. The the Octothorpe character. 
Uh, what did you pronounce that as, and what do you pronounce that as? What's okay, is, are, 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 are my children putting you up to this? Is this <laughs> no, no. Is, is this BK Hatchel number one fan that's putting this, you up this, to this? Because this, I, this you tell him I will control, find yeah. him and I will bust him. <laughs> okay, so the... The, what Adam is trying to get me to say, and I will just like so I have. Oh no, no! I, my, I've changed over time. I've, I've succumbed to the to the children. The children. Well, so the I called the octothorpe a pound, a pound sign, and the the children obviously don't recognize. And I, when I say children, I don't mean that pejoratively. In this case, I actually mean it literally. Oh, literally, oh, and pejoratively with my own children. But the 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 <laughs> the, the Gen Zers call that hashtag. So, like, you know, the password to get into the garage is, you know, hashtag 28 or whatever. Um, the, and I'm like, hashtag don't, or hash. And then I realized that, like, I have started to say hashtag. So. so I've always called it pound sign until uh, I got my first job working at an embedded systems company, um, Camgen, where I was introduced to calling it hash by a Unix, an old Unix dude who also told me, what Unix people like to call some of the other symbols. Like, for example, the symbol that you can do when you press Shift-1. What do you call that, Brian? Bang. 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 Exactly. And what about Shift-8? Shift eight? Eight. Hold on, I gotta go to my keyboard. What is Shift-8? I don't even know what I type anymore. Splat ampersand? Wait, Splat star. Some people call that Splat. That yep. is, but I, some people, that's not me. I don't know, like, I've heard of that. I didn't do that. I wasn't there when that happened. I don't know. I, it sounds like you're trying I, to disavow I, I, yourself saying, of like, your I, own. I don't know. Something I read online. I like no. I have never. I've always called that star. Tom, what have you called that? Uh, usually star, but splat if I'm feeling like a computer scientist. I also Could you disambiguate. By I'm most... like a, maybe whistling the tone that it would be on a DTMF <laughs> pad. <laughs> would you mind? <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Jeremy. Exactly. Thank you for. Uh, th th this is how I, I pl plan to spend my final days on Earth, is at the uh, uh, whistling various tones. Um, I feel, like a, Yay, I feel like a lot of these other, like, okay, at sign, clearly. I feel <clears> like <throat> um, the, what do we say for shift six? I don't know that I've ever used that in conversation. Carrot. And. Or a hat. Oh, shift six, carrot. Or a hat. Yeah. I heard so. Carrot that shifts. Does anyone say hat? What do hat. I say? I don't even know what I say. Yeah. I am like, Some I'm so disoriented right now. Did you know that that used to be a valid character for specifying a pipe in the shell? I, you know, I think no, I have. I think it still is. In born shell, it still is. It still is. It's just not a lot of things handle it well, but Wait, it's still there. Are you serious? No. Sure. Well, it depends on the shell, but it's certainly still in the born shell. Right. Yeah, if you go all the way back and you're in like POSIX born shell mode, it works, but everything else doesn't handle it. Yeah, my shell is not handling it now. I, I mean, I, it, was this a prank to see if I would type that, by the way? Is that, oh, am I yeah, being rude yeah. right now? If, if you're using something <laughs> modern, it probably won't work. So no, it's legit. C shell co opted that for doing substitution for the last command. You could do caret foo, caret bar to replace foo with bar. So it won't work on like C shell derived shells and, and bash and so forth adopt that syntax by default. But if you find yourself an old Unix system or, you know, run a modern shell in some sort of Uber compat mode, it'll probably treat that like a pipe character. Yeah. Or if you go and install like uh, the old, what uh, is it? Uh, KSH or whatever, like the, or the old one from AT&T, which I think is now available and built in a lot of distributions. If you install that, um, in POSIXly mode, it will actually do that as well. So if you, if you really want fun with character names, you should take a read of the old Intercal manual. The, uh, oh, and no. Intercal, yeah. is, that, is Intercal deliberately designed to be unusable? Oh, it's designed to be hilarious. Uh, the, 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 <laughs> manual, the, ma the manual was written well before the language. Um, oh, interesting. Well, that yeah, scares Intercal me. Intercal was the first joke language, right? or at least right. among the first joke languages. It was designed a, literally as a joke. I mean, not like, oh my god, that's a joke. Like COBOL is a joke. I mean, it was it was meant to be funny, right? And it it one of my brothers is a co-author. So. And I want your brothers. I think that I think Tom that applies to, to many things. I feel it's, that they, it's true. It's true. 
Um, mm. I am um, Matt. I, I am trying to approve you. I when I when I go over go to yeah, a click, I'm, I'm gonna yeah. We have to kick someone off. So uh, apologies for the person I'm about to kick off. There you go. Um, yeah, th that's what, uh, right. It's not giving me an error message. Yeah, that. you can kick off Land Belanke. So. Um, yeah, the, the other fun I've had with characters recently is is using uh, the Anvil Unix that someone someone found a copy, and so you can bring it up in a. 3270 terminal emulator. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hey, Matt. Sorry, we're Thomas. Yeah, and and uh, <laughs> the thing is, these 3270 terminals are EBCDIC, and they're missing all kinds of characters that Unix people are used to. So in, instead of a um, backslash, it's a cent sign and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, this is uh, this is Matt Campbell. Um, I can you guys hear me? Yep, we can, Matt. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, you guys were uh, you guys were talking about uh, uh, pronunciation of various punctuation marks earlier, and I was reminded about how. Uh, so I, I'm I'm uh, legally blind, visually impaired, and some I often use a screen reader, and I was, uh, I was uh, just thinking about how the different screen readers pronounce punctuation marks, and. You can tell that so one of one of the most popular screen readers uh, is for Windows uh, called the NVDA. It stands for Non Visual Desktop Access, and it's an open source screen reader written by blind programmers. Uh, and of course, they wrote it largely for themselves. And as far as I know, it is the only screen reader that pronounces the Shift One as bang. Oh, rather than explanation sweet so so yeah those those guys obviously wrote you know at least when it came to that they did what they wanted for themselves i feel and, that they should be considered <laughs> canonical for any of these disputes i feel we should go to that screen reader and determine what, for <laughs> for any dispute we have so then what do they do what do they do for shift eight because like that one has like three or four different words for it And I'd be curious about Shift Seven because I don't know what you would say it as. Uh, hang on, let me uh, let me find oh. out. Let me let me get back in front of my PC. That's great. Uh, so T. So, so Shift Eight is Shift Eight is star. Okay. Shift Seven is and. Which of course is ambiguous with the word "and," Ooh. but oh, that is yep. interesting. But maybe, maybe they yeah, maybe they figure that you would just know from context which one it is. Like if you're reading so, C here's, code, here's another... if you're reading C code, then you know that you will find ampersands more often than the word "and," and the reverse, of course, if you're reading Python. And Matt, are you a programmer as well? Yes, I am. So you, I mean, this. Comes up now, presumably I, quite a bit. Now for you. programming, um, I I do I I have enough sight that I can read the screen up close, so I tend to do my programming that way. Got it. But okay. but um, I but you know the, anyway. So so am I and, saying it right? Uh, is it and shift six is carrot? By the way. Yeah. Sweet. So the interesting thing about this is that. I would have expected the ampersand symbol to be read as et or et cetera, because that is the, that is the unambiguous way to describe it. You know, maybe I should open a GitHub issue about that. <laughs> it, it actually does surprise me. I hadn't that heard of not, that one before. It, it surprises me that it's not ampersand. Because it's a Latin. It's a, well, because it's a, because the ampersand symbol, which is also known as the and sign in English, is a ligature to refer to etc. So it's it's the combination of etc. Now as no, one I'm letter. I'm, 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 just, I'm not it's surprised. An, it's not Latin and et. That's because so, in older script true. in older script you see the ampersand followed by c for etc. I hmm um now I guess. It, it, I guess it's not too surprising that that that. Oh, well, I mean that the 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 at least one of the main programmers of NVDA was blind from birth. So 
I guess, having never actually seen an ampersand, I guess it wouldn't be surprising that he wouldn't have made that connection. Hey, Matt, but oh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But I, I'm curious if you've ever go ahead. I, I'm, I'm curious if you've ever had an opportunity to use Emacs speed. Um, I uh, <clears throat> I actually contributed to the Emacs speak project back in like 1998, 99. Oh, cool. I made uh, I made an RPM package for Emacs speak back in the day. Very cool. Uh, wow, ooh, ask and answered. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've used it, though. I I mean, one of the things that T.D. Raman did when he wrote that that I thought was really cool. At least I, I think he did this. I might be misremembering, but he would indicate stuff like scope by a change in pitch of the voice as it was read. And uh huh, th- I thought that was super unfortunately cool. I never had the fancy schmancy uh, speech synthesis device that he had. He he. He had, uh, yeah. He he wrote Emacs Speak primarily for a speech synthesizer called Deck Talk. Yeah. Which, yeah. One <laughs> guess as to which company that came from. <laughs> oh man, you are like Dan right now. Is it, I, I mean, you you've, you've made Dan very happy. I feel that. I mean, Dan. It, it, I, I mean, I, I shouldn't think of you as a deck apologist or sympathizer, but I think both. Well, of and true. Raman Raman actually worked for Deck when he started on Emacs Speak. I think. I, in like 95 yeah he wrote it but, in grad school i thought um and i mean he probably used a deck workstation and i think he did like an internship there or something like that yeah the, now he he later added support for a soft and, and, and deck talk was a, a hardware device that it was either it was either a card that you could install inside your pc or a box that you could hook up to the serial port now he later added I, he later added support for a software speech synthesizer called IBM Via Voice, but uh, the speech synthesizer that I had back at that time was called Double Talk, and it it was much more uh, limited in terms of the vocal parameters that you could change. Gotcha. Matt, is there a good? I mean, this is I, I feel like this is such an interesting and important and and Justin hit on this last time in terms of like this is such a life-changing aspect of technology that I don't know the history of well at all. I mean, the things you're talking about are things you know, I'm not familiar with I, at all. I was actually thinking over give, you know, going through like a, an, an, a, a semi-impromptu oral history of screen readers. If if you... That would be... That would be cool. really neat. That would be very... At cool. least, I mean, well, and, and, and surely incomplete because I, I don't know everything about that field either. You know, but, I kind of... Ooh. But you know, yeah, more I, than I we kind do. of. I, so, Matt, I don't want to, to put you on the spot, but I think we're because we're kind of we're at the hour kind of here, and we do we do want to keep these kind of bounded. What would you think about picking that up next week as kind of our topic for our space next week? Would you be Would you be down for doing your uh, doing? Sure. I, I mean, just in, just in general, like accessibility technology and the history. Yeah, I mean, of- I, I was I was kind of looking for my opening the whole time, um, and I, I didn't want to force it, but yeah, that would be. Uh, now yeah, you yeah, have so one. Let's, yeah. let's do that next week. I think that that would be super educational. I know I would learn a lot. And again, this is a domain of, of technology that is, I mean, I'm sure for you has been life changing and I, for many other people as well has been, has been, and I think, you know, you kind of hear about some of these technologies that are incredibly life changing and then they don't have a big enough market. So they begin to like go away, which is, I, I'm sure is also. Well, and, and uh, open, I mean, yeah. Uh, De- accessibility for 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 open source operating systems like desktop Linux has 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 been kind of just just barely hanging on, and and on the proprietary side, what we see is that Apple and Google and Microsoft now have screen readers built into their operating systems that are, in, at least in some ways, just good enough, and. Right. And and uh, the the future of third party uh, Windows is the one platform that the one mainstream proprietary platform that really supports third party screen readers. And the future of that is kind of, well, people wonder how much longer. I mean, yeah, bluntly, it's probably dead Um, with with what's going on with with the future of windows it's oh by the way dead. i worked on the windows accessibility team at microsoft <laughs> oh, for three years oh, oh 
<laughs> nice. Of course you did. Oh, Matt, that's great. I, this, okay, I do love this is, this is like the internet at its best. Yeah, I'd like next to week. Right, now, so let's talk next week. Um, I am convinced that if if Dan hears Emacs and Deck in the same sentence, he has to sit down. I mean, I, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong. I just feel that like that's that's where Dan becomes overcome with emotion when he hears both of those two great loves in the same sentence. <laughs> Why do you think Dan. I have this love of Emacs? I mean, I, it, like I, I find it useful. One but yeah. Emacs is awesome. I feel like you like beaten me within inches of my life with it several times. I think that part okay, of I, I I I have no idea who Dan is. I I I I don't know most of you guys but uh um uh, emacs and deck did both come from massachusetts right and di- yes and, and, both and awesome. dan, dan is a red sox fan along oh, with my co-host uh, oh, there that, you that's go it. Yeah, oh, that's, I, I i quit Ryan. i'm gonna get a new job <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's exactly all right on on that note on and, and one yeah one last thing I don't necessarily know many of you either, but uh, from Bell Labs in New Jersey, most of us support you on Ed, Brian. <laughs> okay, there we go. Hey, look at that. All right, we'll pick that up next time too. I want to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I may call in my Ed. My Ed posse is gonna. We'll we'll do. Uh, but Matt, if you wouldn't mind kicking this off with an oral history of accessibility technology, and clearly you've been at the epicenter of it, uh, at least at, at, at my Well, I, I, w- I was kind of a latecomer to the industry. I started writing my own Windows screen reader in 2004. But um, yeah, I'll be happy to share what I know. Awesome. That'll be great. Um, thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, Cole, especially for everything you've done for the notes. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah, here. Thanks, Cole. Thanks, everyone. All right, and thanks, Laura, too, for everything on Hubris. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.